In the 14th century, strongest and largest kingdom on Iberian Peninsula, the Kingdom of Castile, was ruled by King Alfonso XI the Avenger. Despite being married to his double first cousin Maria of Portugal, daughter of King Alfonso IV of Portugal, his lover Eleanor de Guzman, who bore him ten children, gave a great many titles and privileges to their sons. This caused discontent among many of the noblemen, and in particular Queen Maria, with her son and Alfonso's heir Pedro, later known as Pedro the Cruel and the Just. They had a chance for revenge when Alfonso died unexpectedly from a black death in the siege of Gibraltar in March 1350. They pushed Eleanor, her sons and their supporters aside, so they fled and scattered. They were fearful of what their half-brother, the new King Pedro I of Castile, could do to them. The late king had not even been buried. Although Eleanor and her sons reached an agreement with Pedro to live peacefully in his court, the situation remained unstable. Enrique of Trastamara, who was the oldest of Eleanor's sons, and his brothers, Padrique, Tello, and Sancho, staged numerous rebellions against the new king. Also, to strengthen his position and gain allies, Enrique married Juana Manuel, the daughter of Juan Manuel, Prince of Vilena, Adelantado Mayor of Murcia and Lord of Vilena, the most prosperous nobleman of the realm. In 1351, the king took counsel from Juan Alfonso de Alquerque, his mother's right-hand man. He became convinced that his father's lover was the instigator of the uprisings, so he ordered Eleanor to be incarcerated and finally executed in Talavera de la Reina. After that, Enrique fled to Portugal. He was pardoned by Pedro and returned to Castile, then revolted in Asturias in 1352. He reconciled with his brother only to rebel against him in a long, intermittent war, which ended with Enrique's flight to France, where he entered the service of Jean II of France. Shortly after, Enrique and his men spent time in Pedro IV of Aragon's army in their war against Castile, also known as Wars of the Two Pedros. In this war, Pedro of Castile sought to claim the Kingdom of Valencia, while Pedro of Aragon wished to dominate the Mediterranean in opposition to Castile and Castile's ally, Republic of Genoa. During that conflict, Enrique was defeated and held prisoner in Najera. He was liberated and exiled himself to France once more. At the beginning of 1361, the Castilians conquered few Aragonian fortresses. However, the peace was negotiated in May of 1361 in which all conquered places and castles were returned to their original lords. In June 1362, Pedro of Castile met with Charles II of Navarre at Soria, and mutual aid was promised. Pedro of Castile also contracted an alliance with Edward III of England and Edward's son, the Black Prince. With these negotiations complete, the Castilian king invaded Aragonese territory without officially declaring war. And the conflict commenced again. The Aragonese king was at Perpignan without troops and thus caught off guard. The Castilians again took number of castles but were unable to take Calatayud even though they attacked with all types of siege equipment. Without taking his conquests any further, Pedro returned to Seville. In 1363, Castile continued the war against Aragon with receiving reinforcements from Portugal and Navarre. Pedro won many successes against Aragon, while Trastamaran propaganda failed to undermine Castilian loyalty toward him. In 1365, therefore, the French King Charles V, Pope Urban V and Pedro IV to save Aragon from being overrun and help Enrique to get on Castilian throne, conducted alliance and France and Aragon paid to recruit mercenaries for Enrique's cause removing the free companies from France and supporting the ascent to power in Castile of their favorite. The strength of the army of Enrique rested primarily on these companies, groups of mercenaries that have participated in the Hundred Years War, composed mainly by Bretons, Gascons, English and French, 
led by Bertrand de Gouclin. Enrique was proclaimed king in Calahora in 1366. In return, he had to reward his allies with titles and riches for the help they had provided. Pedro fled to Gascony and requested English help under the Anglo-Castilian alliance concluded in 1362. Pedro's request was met with a certain amount of skepticism at first. Prince Edward knew that the costs of raising an army were exorbitant and the prince wanted something concrete for his troubles. Consequently, Pedro agreed to give Edward the Duchy of Biscay as a reward, tax exemptions for English merchants and the hereditary right to lead armies into Castile. The deposed monarch also agreed to repay the prince all the costs he would incur from raising his forces. England would not allow France to ally with Castile to establish Enrique as the new king. When Pedro of Castile sought help, King Edward of England ordered Sir John Chandos, the constable of Occitan, and other commissionaries to ensure that the Gascon and English mercenaries stopped assisting Enrique. The prince and Pedro then held a conference with Charles of Navarre at Bayonne and agreed with him to allow their troops to pass through his dominions. In order to persuade him to do this, Pedro had, beside other grants, to pay him 56,000 florins, and this sum was lent him by the prince. Pedro and the prince also agreed that Charles would be rewarded with the Castilian promises of Guipuzcoa and Alava as well as additional fortresses and a large cash payment. Charles typically tried to exploit the situation by making agreements with both sides that would enlarge his territory while leaving Navarre itself relatively untouched. Officially, he was ally of Pedro of Castile, but at the end of 1365 he concluded a secret agreement with Pedro IV of Aragon to allow the marauding army led by Bertrand de Gouclin to invade Castile through southern Navarre in order to depose Pedro and supplant him with his half-brother Enrique. In return, he would receive border town of Logrono and more cash. Hearing of this, the Black Prince ordered Hugh Calvary to invade Navarre from northern Castile and enforce the original agreement. Charles at once capitulated, claiming he had never been sincere in his dealings with Enrique, and opened the passes to the Prince's army. Charles ac accompanied them on their journey but, not wanting to take part in the campaign personally, got Olivier de Maugny to stage an ambush in which Charles was captured and held until the reconquest of Castile was over. The ruse was so transparent, it made Charles a laughing stock in Western Europe. Prince Edward left Bordeaux early in February 1367 and joined his army at Dax where he remained three days and received the reinforcements of 400 men-at-arms and 400 archers sent out by his father under his brother John, Duke of Lancaster. From Dax, the prince advanced via saint jean pierre de port through Roncesvalles in the Pyrenees to Pamplona, the capital of Kingdom of Navarre. Roncesvalles can be treacherous even in the summer, and now it was the middle of winter, with thick snow, temperatures well below freezing and not a blade of grass for the horses nor an ear of corn for the men to be found. It says a very great deal for the logistic arrangements of the army that they traverse the pass and reach the plains north of Pamplona in good order. We do not know the names of their quartermasters who worked out how much fodder and rations needed to be carried and who hired the mules and the cars to transport it but with experienced men like Sir John Chandos, Sir Robert Knollys and Sir William Felton, it was an army well accustomed to campaigning in difficult terrain and in foul weather. Enrique had success using guerrilla tactics and skirmishing against the army of the Black Prince once it started marching through Castilian territory. Castilian troops had great offensive power and greater mobility thanks to their lighter armament, something that made them ideal for this type of action unlike the slow and heavily armored army of Edward and Pedro, composed mainly of heavy infantry and heavy cavalry. He was an experienced soldier, having fought in France as a great company commander against the English and knew that the best military strategy to take on the army of the Black Prince was to wear it down with the harsh Castilian lands, hunger and the skirmishes. 
These were also the recommendations of the King of France and Bertrand de Gauclin. The Light Cavalry was an old tradition in the Castilian military systems and was designed for the frequent skirmishes with the Moors, even though the idea had been abandoned by the other European armies of that time. From Pamplona, the prince marched by Aruiz to Salvatierra, which opened its gates to his army and then advanced to Vitoria, intending to march on Burgos by this direct route. In the small battle of Arenas in March 1367, a vanguard of Enrique's army formed by Hinetes, led by Don Tello and Aragonese and French knights led by Arnold de Atherim, Pierre Le Buguet de Villon and Juan Ramirez de Arellano, wiped out a detachment of the Black Prince army. Enrique's vanguard, easily defeated, groups ahead of the bulk of the army of the Black Prince by skirmishes and then headed back to their base. On their way, they met with an exploration detachment of the Black Prince Army, which was led by Seneschal of Occiton, Sir Thomas Felton with 200 men-at-arms and archers. After suffering many casualties, the detachment of the Prince of Wales entrenched on the hill of Inglesemendi, where an English longbowman resisted the Castilian Light Cavalry. The French and Aragonese soldiers dismounted and attacked as infantry, defeating them. There died among others, Sir William Felton, Seneschal of Poitou and Captain of the Great Companies, many others were captured. Thomas Felton, the Captain of Great Companies, Richard Thornton, Sir Hugh Hastings, the Military Lord John Neville, the Captain of Great Companies, Agorices, and the Gascon Mercenary Captain of Great Companies, Gaillard Viguier, among others. The army of the Black Prince that had been considered invincible had suffered its first defeat and although their losses were not large in comparison with the army, the troops began to become demoralized. Edward found out that the Enrique had occupied some strong positions and especially Santo Domingo de la Calzada on the right of the river Ebro and Zaldiaran mountain on the left, which made it impossible for him to reach Burgos through Alava. Accordingly, he crossed the Ebro and encamped under the walls of Logron. During these movements, the prince's army had suffered from want of provisions both for men and horses and from wet and windy weather. On 2nd April, he left Logrono and moved to Navarrete. Enrique again blocked access to Burgos by controlling the river Najerila and with his French allies encamped at Najera, so that the two armies were now near each other. While military situation for Enrique looked promising, the political situation was quite different. More people adhered to the cause of Pedro that gained strength, while Enrique's alliances weakened, because avoiding confrontation was seen as a sign of weakness by the Castilian nobility. Politics forced Enrique's hand. Thousand fortresses on the English approach route were declaring for Pedro. There were mutterings in the ranks of the army, from the Castilians who thought Enrique was behaving in a cowardly fashion, and from the French and the mercenaries, who wanted a battle so they could get be paid. Against all his better judgment, and against Duguclan's strongly worded urgings, Enrique decided to fight, or if he did not, he would forfeit his throne by default as the population increasingly turned to Pedro. Time was playing against the ambitious Enrique, who advanced with his forces, leaving behind the protection of the river Najerila to confront his half-brother. To prevent disaster, he had to face the most prominent mercenary troops of Europe in a battle in the open and with the river in his back cutting his retreat, despite the opposition of his field commanders. This move left Enrique with only one bridge to cross the swollen river with deep banks should he need to retreat. The most likely tactical explanation is that he felt that the strength of his army lay in its cavalry. Therefore, his horsemen could be used to best advantage on the featureless plain that separated Najera from Navarrete. At about mid-afternoon on 2nd April, shortly after arriving at Navarrete, Prince Edward ordered his men to take food and then lie down to sleep. He sent secret orders to his subordinates that they would be moving toward Najera at about midnight. At the appointed time, the Anglo-Gascon army arose from slumber and began forming their line of march. 
They did not, however, move along the east-west road, which was the most direct route to Nahera. Edward's scouts had found a series of hills and ridges which flanked the road. Edward ordered his army to make a wide flank march to the northwest of the road, with the hills screening their movement. Near dawn, they began marching southwards, hoping to take the Franco-Castilian army in the left flank. After marching through the night, Edward's army emerged from the darkness on Saturday morning, April 3rd, to threaten Enrique's army. But Enrique had taken similar precautions, having his army sleep until midnight, then deploy east of Nahera. Initially taken by surprise, Duga Clan hurriedly realigned the men under his immediate command, which was in the first line of Franco Castilian army. The second and third Castilian lines were less well organized and spent some time trying to reorganize.